right, let's get going here. Uh, lots lots to get through today. So we're going to start off with our first uh, presentation here. Uh, I've got Karadak Malhatra, who's the Director of Sports Science and Analytics at Texas A&M University. Uh, Karadak uh, graduated from the University of Pune, sorry, Pune uh, in India as an electronics engineer with a specialization in artificial intelligence. Uh, continuing in his work as a sports analyst, he started in the final year of his engineering degree and he helped Salka Kar. Oh, Salgakar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that wasn't that far off. SC <laughs> and Dempo SC win the one I League titles in consecutive years. Then he moved to the United States and graduated with a master's degree in a master's in science degree in sport management from Florida State, um, with a focus on analytics. And since graduating from FSU, he's worked with the NFL and NBA Combine programs at IMG Academy consulted a number of NFL, NBA, and MLS teams during his stint with Stat Sports Technologies and has been an integral part of Jimbo Fisher's staff at Florida State and now at Texas A&M leading their sports science testing, research, and implementation. Ladies and gentlemen, Karaj Mahatma. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, um, I just want to say one thing before we get started. Um, there are a few things on here that I still I still have Florida State on it. And the reason why you know I want to have Florida State on is because we are not into the season yet at A and M, so we haven't really implemented that. And I just want to I don't want to put like an A and M tag on it and tell you something which is not true. So everything that I'll be showing you here, we have done this and it's been implemented. Uh, works fine. All right, let's start off. All right, so here's the scenario: ten seconds to go in the game. It's the last play of the game. Um, the, the head coach is called the final timeout. They need a touchdown to win. Uh, the head coach walks over to the sports scientist and the performance analyst. And he asks, which receiver should I put in the final play? You know, who has the best change of direction? Who has the best completion percentage? Who, who, is complete, who is running the best possible routes? Who has run the best possible routes in this game? The, the sports scientists and the performance analysts, they do some calculations, they do some math, they, and they make a suggestion. The, the head coach goes with it. He, the play starts, the ball is snapped, the, wide, and the quarterback gets the ball, he makes a perfect throw. The, the wide receiver turns around, jumps high, latches onto the ball, touchdown and they win. That never happened. Very good morning, I'm Pratik Malhotra, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, Alright, let's get started. Alright, so a little about myself, I think you covered everything. Um, I'm the director of sports and talent at and um, I just moved there from uh, the state of Coach Fisher. I did my undergrad in engineering with, uh, with a specialization in artificial intelligence. Uh, master's in sports analytics, uh, I mean sports management, but specialist in sports analytics. It's my first year with AM and I worked for four years with Florida State. I specialize in machine learning, data visualization, and data mining. Um, I'm just going to skim through the job responsibilities. So I, um, again, you know, I know in different presentations people tend to take pictures. I'll send you all the presentations, so don't, you don't need to take pictures, you'll have everything. Um, and if you all need to get in touch, I mean, you know, I'm pretty approachable, so it's not a big It's going to be real easy. Um, um, you know, I help design the pre-season, in-season, and post-season periodization plans. We do a lot of, uh, you know, sports science research and testing. Uh, we help prevent injuries. Uh, sometimes, sometimes you don't. I mean, you give your shot, but it doesn't work out. I work with the sports medicine, sports nutrition, and strength staff, and uh, that. But that's basically the sports science side of things. The analytics in my title comes because we deal with a lot of football data as well. So we tag uh, everything that's relative to a player from a football standpoint. So completions, incompletions, men on the line, all that stuff. Trying to find our own tendencies, our tendencies in our own team. Um, but yeah, that's basically it. About the staff, um, I have a full-time assistant, um, a graduate assistant, a couple of interns, and I, and I report directly to the head football coach. Um, so the ground rules, the ground rules, the recipe to make this work. Um, the first thing is to make it simple. You know, 
um, give me a suggestion to reduce a complicated symbol. If you're going to sell something that's really, really, really complicated to a football coach, you know, he's probably he's probably going to back off and he's going to be like, I don't know if I want to even listen to this. Um, but you know, with time, best will be able to be on the same page. Um, so how to make, the challenge is how to make a football coach trust the data. The reason why it's worked for us at Florida State, the reason why it works for us at A&M, is because you know, a head coach really buys into the data. He really buys, buys into everything that we are trying to you know, tell him. Um, so the first, the first step is analyze well. And it's really, really important to analyze well because it gives you confidence in you and, and you're ready for any questions that, kind of, that are asked to you. Secondly, you've got to prove the coach right. You can't just walk in and you can't just be like, okay, like whatever you're doing is absolute shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't mean to say shit. Okay. Um, but you can't walk in and you can't just be like, look, you know, everything that you're doing is not right. You've got to change these 20 things. If you go in, the football coach is going to be like, look, I've been successful for all these years and I haven't had you, so why, why would I need you now? Um, so you got to first prove the coach, right? you got to tell him, all right, whatever you're doing is great, it's fantastic, you know, but maybe, maybe we can make these 5% changes, and obviously that takes time. Um, and with that, like, you'll be able to establish a dialogue. But then after you, but in order to do that, you got to first learn the coach's language. You know, when I first, when I first started Florida State, we were, I think we were talking about accelerations and, uh, you know, and, and like, basically big terms. You're talking about the readings that are coming from the accelerometer and all that. And the coach was like, what is all this? You know? So like what what he wants to hear is if you talk about change of direction, he wants to talk about twitch. You know, if you if you say accelerations, he wants to hear explosiveness. So may, so you know you gotta basically pick and choose words that you want to tell the coach. And then again with time, in like a near couple of years, you all will be on the same page. But uh, that's really important. You gotta be brutally honest. You know, if someone's not doing well, you gotta be like, look, it's not gonna. He's not doing well. You know, maybe we can push him to another level. If the coach has made a guy work too much, you gotta be like, all right, maybe we need to pull this guy back. And at times you're gonna get cussed out. I get cussed out once every week, and it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfectly fine. But, um, but, okay, so there are a few things that we use from a sports science standpoint. So we use GPS monitors, we use Catapult as a GPS system. Uh, ben from Modus is here. So we use uh, Modus for like a quarterbacks and we track, uh, we track the workload in their arms, we, tr we see the point of release, um, the speed at which they're throwing the ball, and then with that we try to, to get the, the trends um, and we try to see what's working, what's not working, how to do the chain actually. Um, we use the sleep and readiness bands. Now, some of the sleep stuff that I'll be showing you here is from Fatigue Science. At a and we'll be using Rise Science. Uh, fatigue Science is great, but it's just a choice that, that the athletic training staff made because, uh, uh, because it was something that they worked with in the past. And we use Nordboards um, for hamstring stuff, ham uh, right from hamstring strengthening to hamstring testing and everything. Now, moving on. Now, one of the first things that we did, actually one of the main things that we did with the GPS was to help a coach plan practice. Now, again, this is not something that we have done at a &M right now, so I'm going to show you the Florida State thing. So, stop. All right, so, so the thing on the left right here is the fatigue <coughs> factor. So it, so for every single drill, you have a corresponding number that tells you how fatigued a guy is going to be if that drill is done for a certain amount of time. So when he, when the coach is planning a practice, this is a template. You go, you end up, you know, maybe you want 10 minutes of this drill, 10 minutes of this drill, 15 minutes of the next drill. I'll show you. So you, so you, so you start entering times. So you start entering time, maybe he wants 15 minutes of that drill, 17 of that drill, 20 of that drill, 15 minutes of that drill, 10 minutes of that drill. All right, and at the end it tells you that from a fatigue standpoint, from a volume and intensity standpoint, it's going to be an 86% practice. Now when we are designing the periodization scheme, we, we sit down and we're like, all right, do we want an 86%? At this point of the season, did we plan an 86% practice? 
maybe you want we plan for that day 95 percent practice in that case you know you are you're adding to that practice if not if you wanted like a 75 percent practice you're cutting back but the main thing about this is you're giving the remote control is still in the coach's hands i think the place where a lot of sports scientists these days suffer is when uh, is when they go in and they go like well you know you need to do things this way or it's not going to work i think stuff what's really worked for us is we are still giving them more to the coach's hand I'm like all right this is what we plan and you know this is what it's showing it's showing it's going to be 86 percent if you still think we need a 95 percent practice you can either add a drill you can increase minutes in the drill that you feel are important and that way and that way like you know we have You've had success, and uh, it's really worked. Um, now, how how do we come up with a fatigue factor? Now, so for this, we take the GPS data. So we, when we started, we took about 15, 20 metrics. It took change of direction, it took accelerations, decelerations, um, total distance covered, high intensity distance, high speed running, heart rate, bunch of things. So you took you took all the GPS data that you thought was important. And and you and you did dimension reduction for, with it. So you basically lay instead of 15 metrics, you try to identify. You did regressions and you tried to identify six or seven that kind of came out most important. And you said, all right, you know these are the metrics that you're going to cover. Then you then you took a particular weighting with those metrics. You do permanent values so that everyone can see. And then you convert everything. To the, the percentage skills that everything's on the same scale, and then you came up with the GPS fatigue. Then, now you took that and you added uh, that, and you took that and you mixed it with the RPE scale. So, like the way we do, I mean, now we do one uh, one a session, but like for the first 30 days of, or like you can say probably the whole fall camp, what we do is we. Uh, we do something of this sort now. They have iPads and stuff, so it's better. This is from 2013 when we first started. So we give them a sheet of paper, and we'd ask them to rate every guy. We'd ask them to rate a particular drill, every single drill in a practice. So maybe when they started the practice, the first drill was two. You know, we we start with special teams usually, the kickoffs. So maybe the first drill was two. Now, you know, guys who are not involved in special teams, they're going to give a lesser number. The guys who are running special teams and running every play, they're going to give a higher number. You know, there are going to be guys who are going to not give you give you what they feel. They're going to put fives to the whole thing. You gotta when you're doing the calculations, you gotta throw that out. Um, with but basically we did this. We took 60% of the GPS data. We took 40% of the RPE data. Now why was the ratio 60-40? I don't know. We just made stuff up. We're <laughs> like, we're like All right, maybe this is going to work. You know, um, and. Me and the head strength coach, Coach Big, we both sat down and were like, all right, you know, what if you do 70, 30? Is it gonna be too much reliance on the GPS data? If we are doing that, then maybe we don't even need to consider the RP data. But if you go 50, and we thought of doing it 50, 50, if you do 50, 50, then like, you still don't know like which players are, you know, rating it 100%. So we just, it was basically, you know, throwing stuff against the wall and hoping it sticks. But uh, but we took 60-40 and, uh, and it worked and it worked well. Uh, the way we tested it was we, in, in between the season and fall camp, we had like a four day break. We took it to the head coach and we were like, all right, does a Monday practice, is, is your Monday practice about 77, 78%? Is your true Tuesday practice about 90, 95%? And he's like, yeah, that sounds about right. And in addition to this, we pulled out the volume and intensity metrics, and we were like, all right, does this seem right? Does this percentage seem right for volume and intensity? And you agreed, and we were like, all right, well, you know, that means it works. The result was designing a periodization scheme. So we took that data, in those three, four days, we designed a periodization scheme for the rest of the season. Now, this was for 2012, um, and this was the first time we designed a periodization scheme. And if you look at that, you, you see how imbalanced it is. You look at this, you s it's, it's a lot more controlled. Um, um, if you see the level at which we could push the guys, it was a lot higher as compared to that, because there was too much of ups and downs. You know, um, Again, you know, on day one, you're not going to have a coach switch his practice. There was once the head coach 
I, I once told him, I was like, Coach, like, we, he, he's like, uh, we're going to have a high practice. And I said, oh, you know, maybe we should have a walkthrough. <laughs> and he looks at me like I'm crazy. And he's like, oh, we're not having a walkthrough. And he didn't have a walkthrough that day. He had a walkthrough the next day. It was a two and a half hour walkthrough. Because uh, I just got cut out that morning. <laughs> that, uh, that, you know, I'm going to make guys soft, I'm going to help him, I'm going to make sure that the guys are soft and all that stuff. And I was like, no, of course, I can do that. And he went ahead and cussed me out even later, um, why he didn't get stuff done. But, you know, week on, like, he came up and he was like, you know, that really helped. Because we really could teach guys stuff. And they got the rest that they need. Now, again, a lot of stuff that you do, the suggestions, the suggestions that you make, there's always that element to it that, you know, it may not work. Right? But you still but that's why establishing a relationship with the coach who trusts you is so important. But again, that's like with everything. You know, you're calling plays in a game. What if the play doesn't work? What if your formation that you're setting out it doesn't work? Yeah. But uh, and that's why it's poor, that's why it's so cool. Um all right, how do you design a periodization scheme? Again, I think a lot of I think a lot of people here uh, you know, specialize with, with that. But the way uh, we've always done it is you, you take the GPS data for the first and the second team, and then you take the coach's rating from each game. Now, when you're taking the coach's rating, it's not the rating, coaches are not rating how hard they've played the game, but, there's, but they're rating every player on how well they've played the game. So even if a player, after every game, has played like seven plays, a coach goes in and be like, all right, how well has he played? And he rates him on alignment, assignment, and technique. So we took the GPS data for the first and the second team for two years. We um, we took the coaches' rating that they've had for the for two years, and we were like, all right, what what's the best periodization scheme that can come up? What would an ideal Monday practice look like? What would an ideal Tuesday practice look like? Wednesday practice look like? Thursday practice look like? You know, if you need to walk through, how much time do they need to be up? There? And we took that and we came up with a periodization scheme. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and the reason why we did it was in order to get, the aim was to get the best out of the guys on the field. So that's on the performance. Um, so I talked about periodizing practice. I think now where we are at is we are, we are looking, and we, we have been doing it for a while. Um, we, we periodize practices, so within practices, so periods. Um, right here, so the reason why I put this example was because there are a lot of yellows and, and elements, but like usually what usually what you want to do here is when you see this, when you see this in the ball camp, you're like, coach, the next time you're going to run this practice, maybe you should have a green beer. Maybe you should have a punt here. If this guy's getting too much of work here, you know, he should get really less work here so that he can be ready for this now, if you if you do look like if you look if you do look at football as a game, you know you're running a drive, but then the team sits down. They have they have like a rest. They have like a five minute rest uh, when the defense is on the field. And the same thing with defense. You know they're resting. So in practice, I think like NFL it's a little different. But with college, you know it's all about like pushing the guys. You got to go harder, harder, harder. But at times, I mean, are you really training for the sport? what I mean. So, um, you know, you, that's what we're doing. But with all of that, there's a daily report that the coach gets, um, which is really important. And um, that's the daily report. So you're looking at, at basic metrics, you're looking at top speed, you're looking at speed exertion, you're looking at the total distance that he's covering, high intensity accelerations, distance above certain speed bands and heart rates. Um, does, uh, now, heart rate in general, like, it's, we have found it, I don't know, have, have you, do you guys do heart rates during practices and games? Uh, very long then. Okay. Experimenting. Yeah. We, we started do, going like all out in heart rates last year. Um, and I think one thing that we have found is the data can be a little fishy with uh, heart rates popping in and out. So you got to be a little careful with that. But, uh, but I think, you know, you keep the good ones. You, see the heart rate duration, how long was the heart rate monitor on for you in practice. And then, 
kind of go on that. So, but yes, it's something that we have implemented. It's the second year that we are going all in. All nine guys were heart rate monitors, and monitors. It's, uh, you know, it's working okay as of now. Um, you know, we give coaches a weekly report and every single player on how a player is doing, where he's at, what does he need to do. Um, and again, you know, you, you do that taking into account, uh, you know, the opinion of an athletic trainer. So me and the athletic trainer sit down, we are like, all right, and, you know, one of the assistant strength coaches, are like, what did this guy lift? You know, what did, how is this guy from an injury stand? How does his numbers look like? Where is he exactly at? You make a report, you give a report. Um, I was from Florida State. I drew like a mustache with a <laughs> um, data visualization. So, at Florida State, as a visualization partners, we had Spotfire. They're they're a company we used to have in Boston, at A and M, um, and what, that's one of the reasons why I haven't like included, why I have included a lot of Excel and not really much Spotfire because uh, you know we don't have a contact with them as of now with A and M, but we are working. They're an excellent uh, data visualization company. Uh, they, they helped us last year a fair bit with recruiting, um, seeing where the recruits are in the country, where the coaches should go, and stuff like that. But, uh, but yeah, we are close to signing contact with them, so. Um, okay, so my, again, my background is, is data and machine learning and stuff like that. So I think one thing that, that we do is we, One thing, one thing that I do specialize in is creation, met is creation of metrics and testing. Um, one of one of the things that we that we did do was uh, was uh, was come up with uh, a metric of our own. It was called distance to top speed. So how much distance does a guy take in every single rep to hit his top speed? Um, and it was pretty. So this is from 2013 again. Um, one thing that we found was was really staggering. Like you see that there are players who are hitting the top speed in eight and nine yards. So every time a guy starts from rest, you consider that he's hitting his top speed in eight or nine yards. One of the funny thing is when when we saw this, um, I, I went back and looked through all the calculations graphs and I was like, that's not right. I mean, how can a guy hit his top speed from zero? How can, he, how can he go from zero to top speed in eight or nine yards? But, you know, it was true. And each, like this, 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 and the eight yards on top, the funny thing was it was the same guy. It was Devontae Freeman who plays for the hands of He would go from zero to top speed in eight to nine yards, which was incredible. And I went over to every single graph, and I was like, that, that can't be true. Like, but, you know, look at the acceleration, it was uh, pretty incredible. Um, this is about simulating, simulating, uh, you know, looking at the summer training and seeing how closely we're going to get close to uh, the the training during the season. So you basically, is a, you know, you basically select who is a team run. What is a team run going to look like as compared to what we're doing right now? Um, again, I'll send you guys the presentation. I'll just have a look. Um, the same thing with. With the weight room. So how how is the season going to look like? Uh, what we are doing in the summer? Well, basically just to get a better idea of how are we training, you guys? How closely we are getting to where we want to be? Um, more is called back sleeve. So um, I, I'm sure Ben's going to come here this afternoon and he's going to talk a lot about more. Um, if this is the second year, uh, the third, third year actually, we have had that product and and it's worked. Pretty well. One of one of the one of the things that coach really likes is looking at the point of release of an athlete. So you basically you go through the practice and the GAs and the quality control guys they tag they tag every single route that they are doing. You map that time the time on motors and you're coming back and you're like, all right, this particular athlete when he was. Uh, when he was throwing a particular kind kind of ball, when like this quarterback was throwing throwing for a go route, you know, you want to see how his point of release drops as practice goes on. If that angle is too much, that indicates fatigue. 
you know, like, alright, you know, maybe this guy, maybe, you know, we need to give this guy a couple of reps. Like, so many times, you know, I've gone to coach after probably three quarters of practice. Be like, alright, coach, this quarterback needs, like, instead of putting him straight in five reps, just put him in three reps and put the other guy in. Again, you get cussed out, but it's okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, I'm just gonna uh, do these things. Um, fingertip velocity, so it's the, it's the velocity at which he's throwing the ball. Workload, you know, come to bench talk, and I'm promoting it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, sleep data to be used for team science. It gives you effectiveness, efficiency, asking sleep time, sleep. How how many hours a guy slept? How well uh, is his sleep? Rehab and return to play. So I'll just skim through that. That's the green where the guy got injured. Um, you know, we that's the graph of how we built him. Uh, that was over three weeks. So how we built the guy over ready for the season. He got injured first week of fall camp. Um, so we how we built him up as the season went on. Uh, as the fall camp went on, you're getting ready for the season. Football analytics, again, I'll send you guys this. The reason why, I'll just skim over this, but the reason why we do this, the reason why we are getting into the sports science side of things with the, uh, sorry, the football analytics side of things with, with, the, with the sports science side of things is because it completes the picture. So you have, you have all the data, you have the acceleration. Can I get like three more minutes? <laughs> um, you you get the sports science side of things. You're seeing an, an athlete's movements. You're seeing how well is he running, how quickly he's running, the accelerations he's having, hitting the speed that he's running at, and then you take that into account and you look at you look at what is he doing when he's hitting those accelerations. Is he is he being really really successful as a football player or not? And you see a lot of football players who aren't great athletes but are phenomenal football players. Um, so we're trying to combine the two and come up with a product. Um, again, you guys can, I'll send you the presentation so I can just have a look at the video. That's like one of the reports that we give the coaches. Quarterback one, completions and completions, high left, right. Um, the quarterback receiver, you know, the, the routes that, that he's running. Is he completing, is he not completing? I'll just talk to you real quickly through combining data. Now, we've spent a lot of money, we've spent a lot of time, we've sent that information abroad for analysis, we've consulted teams, um, in order to predict injuries. Predicting injuries is, according to me, it's a waste of time. You can prevent injuries, you can be like, all right, you know, this guy may get injured, this practice, next practice, and five practices. But to pinpoint and say, this guy's gonna get injured, this guy's gonna pull a hamstring here, it's very, very difficult. Like we, again, we've spent a lot of money, it's, uh, not very good. Um, I'm just going to skim through this real quick um, just to see how the whole process works, how we combine the whole data. Um, that's that's a receiver's route for route 10. Uh, that's a receiver stats for route 10. And if you look through the right, and you click on the right, the right is the direction. You see that he's basically going, the player has been towards the right, and, uh, and, and receiver has a bunch of infantry high. Now the routes that, that, that we were running were basically flag routes. There, there were a couple of posts, but like they, most of them were like flag routes basically. So like they were going to the right. So he's changed the direction. His explosive cuts to the right for that particular receiver is only one. I look back and I'm like, okay, this guy wasn't doing the best he could cutting out. It could be that he's not naturally talented enough, you know. So you go back to the head coach and go like, do we have to put him in there, or do you want to put a guy in cutting? To who is like better cutting to the right, um, and and he's going. He will. He went against these three defensive backs. You look at their their change of direction, left or right, and you see uh, they're so much better. So why was he doing that? Was he protecting himself because he was he was feeling an injury? He thought he may get injured. What does he know his limitation? Does he know that well he's not good enough? So he's dropping back. He's like you know maybe if I drop short, I'll be able to pass the ball. That's why there are a lot of incompletes high. Or was it his mistake? Though? Like, was quarterback just having like a bad day? Um, you see his arm slot angles dropped a lot, his workload's gone up. Um, so, you know, it could be, that could be one of the reasons. He sleeps fine, they all slept well. But, uh, yeah, again, challenges, like, you all can, uh, you know, when I sent you guys 
the presentation, I can just get through it. Um, and any questions? I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cut you off. If you have any questions for Kodak, I'd ask you to just take it out in the hall afterwards. We've got to keep on schedule, but so much good information here. Let's have a round of applause.